Praise the Lord. It's great to be in church. We're going to put our hands together. Let's clap and give God some praise. Give him the sacrifice of praise.
the order of our service, if we could stand up, amen. Come all you weary. Come all you weary, come find me.
What a beautiful song. Amen. God's presence is here with us. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness.
Lord God, we reverence your holy name. Jesus, be glorified this evening. We so honor you, Lord God. We applaud you. We give you our lives. We give you the praise that only you deserve. Amen. Praise God. We're going to uh, make petition at this point in our liturgy and ask God for miracles. Amen. Let's pray for our grandmother church, Pre Prescott, Arizona. Let's pray for the Morales's, uh, uh, Pastor Greg and Lisa Mitchell. Let's also pray for the Galvans, the Cassios, and Evangelist Hart. Amen. Let's pray for their congregation to uh, be growing. Amen. Families to be helped. Uh, those who have addictions to be broken. Amen. God's power to show up this evening in their service. Amen. We're going to pray for the East Coast, Paul and Linda Campbell. Let's lift up the Ganeers, amen, and the Suspanskis, the Kings, and the Spicers, amen, and all those who are laboring here on the East Coast with us, amen. Let's pray for uh, Mitch and Jillian Connors in Albany. Let's pray for Mike and Mary uh, Harris here in Brockport, amen, success to their work, amen, fruit from that outreach we had last Saturday. Let's also pray for what God is doing in Syracuse, lifting up Matt and Sarah Stoll. Let's pray especially for my pastor, Pastor Keith and Carrie Sullivan. Amen. Let's believe God for the uh, East Rochester Church. Amen. And all God's favor is hand to be upon their new converts and their families, uh, the new people that are locking in. Let's pray for God's favor and success to them and also to us here in Greece. Amen. We have some prayer requests here. Let's pray for uh, William and Angel Soto. Uh, I'm sorry, not Will, William, Wilma, uh, Giotti and Joaquin, the Dominican kids that I met and prayed with uh, two weeks ago on outreach at the beach. Mie, uh, this young man by the name of Miguel Nieves. Let's pray for favor to his life and a quick release. Amen. Dakota. Roberto and Carlos, uh, another older gentleman by the name of Nick, we need uh, miracles in his life. Mark Thomas, Joseph Kelly, and Christian Gonzalez, amen. If there's a need in your life too that I did not mention, amen, we would like to pray for you and we would like to pray with you for your success, amen. Maybe you have a bondage or you need a miracle in your finances, amen. How many believe God for increase and favor, amen, that God is going to prove himself tonight? You lift your hand as a sign to God, and I'm going to pray with you, amen. God sees all your hands. Everybody, every last one of us has a special request. Let's believe God for the miraculous, amen. Let's pray tonight that God's power is released in this building, and your prayer is answered, amen. Pray for the person across the aisle from you. Pray for your brothers and sisters and your every new convert. Pray for Sister Jean, amen, who received Jesus in her heart this morning at this altar. Pray for the families that you know that go to this church. And pray for the people that aren't here yet. Amen. Praise God. Let's believe God for them and much more. Amen. When we subside, amen, I'm going to ask David Bergsland to, to open us up in prayer. Let's all pray. Amen. Make your requests known before God. God is waiting for your prayer request. Amen. He is listening. Right now you have an audience with the King. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Amen. Let's pray. God, we need you. God, we're desperate. To, we're a broken people. God, we have no solution on our own. We have no answers, God. We're calling out to you for our children to be saved, God, to be born again. Fill them with the Holy Ghost, God. Move it in Greece, New York, powerfully, God. Redeeming humanity, Lord, God. We plead the blood of Jesus uh, over all these, Lord, God. Uh, these families here in Greece, God. To break the power of every addiction, pornography, and perversion, alcohol, and drugs right now. We bind uh, marijuana and fentanyl and LSD, Lord, God. We lose your power, God, to satisfy every soul, God, to help people to deal with their issues, God, to give them power, Lord, God, to break through uh, into the supernatural, Lord, God. Answer their prayers. The burdens uh, be lifted tonight, God. The burning desire for the reality of sins forgiven, Lord, God. Touch, save, and deliver, God. Help our leadership churches, God. Answer every prayer request, God, in this uh, community.
community of believers, we're so thankful for your promises, our yea and amen, in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for the Hallelujah. way you're working in our lives. We know that it's it's the for for the the for a purpose we've given you for a reason, and we ask, Lord, that you give us the grace to hear you, so we can understand what you've called us to be and called us to do. Only then can we be satisfied, only then can we be fruitful. And we thank you, Lord, that you move in us by your spirit, that you've got a plan, and the plan is good, and we're almost home. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, God. You magnify in this place tonight to give you the glory and the honor. Amen. Let those prayers come to pass. Hallelujah. And let's take a minute here to greet one another, make everybody feel welcome in this church building. I will richly bless you. We have a few announcements that his church is always on Sunday morning at 1030. If you can't make it, uh, we have an evening service at 630. 530 is our time for prayer to get a hold of God. We need God's anointing in our services. So let's gather on Sunday evening. We also uh, have a midweek service on Wednesday at 730. And uh, 6.30 is a time where we can pray before the church. We always pray an hour before service. This Saturday, we have an outreach here. We're going to do something a little bit different here. We're not going to be going door to door. We're going to be uh, setting up here in the parking lot. And we have a few signs. We're going to be cooking some, uh, maybe some food on the grill. And we're going to be praying for people. Amen. If you can begin to pray for that this week. Uh, we would be thankful for you to be involved in that with us. That'll be at 11 o'clock on this Saturday. Amen. Uh, looking forward to next month, September 9th is a Friday. It is the building dedication for our mother church in Brighton at 1101 uh, Highland Avenue, I think it is, right at the corner of Clover Street near East. Amen. We also have a major outreach, I and mean, I've invited several churches here in the East Coast to labor with us, and they're going to be coming into 
uh, begin to hand out flyers with us. We will be all day for Jesus. Amen. If you can be part of that, we're starting at 11. We'll be uh, wrapping it up at 5 o'clock with a concert here and preaching. People will be giving their testimonies and uh, other visitors will be praying for salvation. Let's pray, get a hold of God and uh, believe Him to save many people on that day. Amen. And add people to this church here in Greece. Amen. Let's go ahead and take up our offering. And this is entitled Covetousness Practiced from 2 Peter 2, verses 14 through 16. Peter is writing that false teachers, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, they are enticing unstable souls. This kind of reminds me of uh, Jim Jones, if you're familiar with him. He got a lot of money out of people as a false prophet, as a false teacher, and as a cult leader in the late 70s. They have a heart trained in covetous practices. They are accursed children, Peter writes. They have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity, through a dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. Some of you are familiar with that story. It's kind of funny in a way. But he took the bribe, the evil king, Balak, I believe his name is, hired him to curse the children of Israel. They were being enumerated. They were gathering there, and they were growing, and they decided to move in right next door to him. Balak is a little nervous. He hires this man who practices divination, who's a false prophet. And he falls into the trap of loving the wages of unrighteousness. And, uh, amen, looking for profit from the work of God. Amen. And let's give tonight, amen, avoiding that covetous spirit that's a real trap. Some of you don't give to the work. Some of you have never tithed, perhaps you've never given. Why don't you make this night a different night, amen, and give something to God. Covetousness is that thing that you have, you have a desire to hold on to all the money that God has given you. God has given you a way of uh, making a, a living, earning a wealth, amen, earning finances, taking care of you. And God is looking for some fruit in your life, amen. Covetousness is holding on to things and holding on to your finances, amen. Why don't you release those finances to God and God will richly bless you. Put God to the test, amen, and watch and see what he will do as you give to God. David, can you come forward and take our offering? The tithes are holy and offerings besides, amen. This is a beginning place that we can invest in souls, we can invest in the work, amen, and what God is doing here. Thank God for all that he has done with our lives for us and through us, amen. Let's go ahead and pray, link our hearts together and invest in eternity. Brother David, can you bless? We thank you, Father, that you have caused us to recognize that everything we do here is gonna probably burn up anyway, so people who aid you and the character that you build in us. So let us be liberal, Lord, and give to you for your purposes. Because nothing here matters. The only thing that matters is we get called up with you and you come back together. And that everybody that we can save, we do save in your name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you for your giving. We greatly appreciate it. Amen. Let's sing that song together. Sacrifice of praise. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer unto him the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer Sacrifices of joy we bring. We bring the sacrifice. 
without your giving. And then because it takes money to run this building, to pay for the lights, amen, to pay for the flyers that we produce, amen, it takes finances, it takes people of faith, amen, to invest in something that, uh, amen, is future and eternal. Thank you, and thank you again. We appreciate the musicians and those who work behind on the computer, amen, we could not do this without you and your faithfulness. Turn with me in your Bible to Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Harry Houdini, the great escape artist, earned his fame by escaping handcuffs, prison cells, and all manner of contraptions that were designed to confine him. He boasted on numerous occasions that no jail cell could ever hold him. He had never failed. He always escaped. Well, almost always. Urban legend says that on one occasion, Houdini entered a cell as he usually did, wearing his street clothes. The authorities shut the jail cell behind him and left him. Alone, he did what he had done so many times before. He pulled a thin but strong piece of metal from his belt and began to work at the lock. But this time the cell wouldn't open. The lock would not yield. He worked feverishly applying his amazing knowledge of locks and their mechanisms to the task. Two hours later, in frustration and failure, he gave up. The lock simply would not yield and the great Houdini had finally failed. Why? What went wrong? The guards had forgotten to lock the cell. <coughs> All he needed to do was to push the door open. The only place that was locked was Houdini's mind. Amen. Many times we don't do the most natural thing and that is in times of desperation to just ask God, help me here. That is the simple, most natural thing, and that will open a door, and then it's not complicated. You don't have to go to school to learn how to pray. You don't have to go to school, uh, divinity school, to learn about asking Jesus and having faith. It's very simple. Even the little children believe. Let's read our scripture. Amen. And Jesus is going to set us free tonight. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Paul's writing. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I've entitled this Power in Us. Now to Him glory. You know God is glorified in our lives. These are some opening statements. When we allow Him to work in our lives, many times we don't give Him right of way. We don't allow Him to move in our hearts in our circumstances, in our life. And so miracles never happen. But when we do, God is glorified. When God produces miracles in us and he answers prayer, he's been doing it for thousands of years. Amen. And you are no different than our ancestors, people who lived hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. 
that we first need to understand God's ability. Thinking is faith towards God. Amen. Thinking about God. Thinking in a realm that we could understand, if it's possible, God's ability to move in our lives. Many times we think about God and his ability to intervene in our situ situation, excuse me, with only limited understanding. We're limited by our perspective. We're limited by our natural understanding. Everything you've been taught in school or what your parents have showed you. I mean, there's a limited perspective. You and I, we only have our eyes and our ears and our senses in this world world to try to figure things out. And so we are limited uh, only by what we think. Amen. When we do this, when we we think only in realm, the realm of the natural, we limit God. We keep back God from doing what he wants to do. This limits God. This controls God. God wants to do incredible, outrageous, outlandish, miraculous things in your life and in your city. Amen. But if you are going to limit him, if you're not going to believe, it will make God smaller than he is. It will make God in our minds, God can only do this. He's never done that. That's impossible. Why would he do that? And we use reasoning powers. And this is why uh, we don't see revival. This is why we have problems in our lives. This is why he cannot move because we are limiting him. We are keeping him back. He's never done it that way before. It's all in your mind. Limiting God when there is so much more that can happen. We don't do it that way. Or you have a, a mindset that says he hasn't done it ever before. Why would he do it now like that? So I really enjoy giving people Annie's testimony. Last night I went down to uh, doing Walmart and I'm talking to some people. Every time I give the miracle of Annie's eyes, I look for the response of the people. It's a measure of their faith. I tell them how Annie came to church and she said, I'm going blind. Can you pray for me? We pray. Uh, that Friday, she texts me. She says, you're not going to believe this, Pastor Paul, but I don't need the operation. And when I tell people this, I'm watching their eyes. I'm looking at their eyes, if their eyes light up or if they keep glaring at me. Or if their smile comes on their face. Some people, they, they say, wow, that is incredible. I love it. That's cool. Groovy, man. And they believe there's an element of faith that is there. Amen. They see that, amen, that God is able to do that. He did it, you know, years ago. He's been doing it for hundreds of years. He's been healing people miraculously. Some people who don't believe, though, they don't believe that God gave her the miracle. They just think that, well, maybe she got better. Maybe... The doctors made a misdiagnosis. Some of you probably think that too. Or they think, well, Annie's kind of crazy maybe and she didn't really, she wasn't going blind and then she was going blind and she went to the doctor. And they make up this story. They're very creative in their minds. They have great abilities to rationalize away a miracle when you speak it. Or maybe something happened to you and you're living proof in front of them. I used to live this insane lifestyle. God has loved me, set me free, and you're there to testify, and they just don't believe it. They don't think it's possible. They try to rationalize, well, you just wanted to change. You just got into a program. You just settled down. You, whatever. They make something up. If you're saying tonight, well, hey, that didn't even happen. You're calling her a liar. Maybe, you know, she's not all there. You know, maybe she's, you know, she's got a creative talent. She makes up an incredible story. 
But as you and I realize through her consequent salvation, she has subsequently been coming to church for over a year with her husband. There's a glow on the woman's face. God is maturing her. God is growing her. She's fruitful in her life. Something supernatural happened in her life. Power was put inside of her. And she's a different person today. We have to understand God's ability. He's made the heavens and the earth. He can do anything he wants to. Jeremiah the prophet writes in 32, verse 17, Ah, oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth. Nothing is too difficult. You have made everything by your great power, your outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. Amen. Take, for example, the Venus flytrap. Amen. I don't know how that could have evolved into this plant that, that actually clamps down on flies and different bugs that land there. Well, this is a plant that can count. Amen. There's a little hair inside there, and when the bug hits their leg on it and kicks it, a clock ticks. If it happens again, within a certain amount of time, it's going to clamp down on that bug. Otherwise, it wouldn't waste the energy. There's also something amazing that God put in this plant that it creates this certain amount of digestive juices to uh, take that bug and not make too much or too little, but a perfect amount is created so that that bug and its protein can be ingested into the plant and the plant can live and survive. That is an intelligent designer. That is God who knows where every atom is in the universe. How big is your God tonight? What can he do? How can he create something in your life, in your flesh? Amen. Matthew 17, 20. Jesus replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as tiny or small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This is what Jesus promised his disciples. Amen. Faith produces something supernatural. Faith Many people think faith is an emotion. Oh, I have faith and they come to worship and they wait for the goosebumps. Faith is not about that. Faith is obedience. Faith is when we release to God what he wants to do. Amen. It's not an emotional hype where, you know, the preacher has to stimulate you and get you excited about what God is going to do a miracle. It's much Simpler than that. Faith is found in first identifying the problem and then <coughs> identifying the fixer. That's a capital <coughs> F. Identifying the problem solver. Amen. You have the problem. You have to get Jesus to help you. You have to call on the power of God. Amen. Faith changes the outcome. Amen. Faith will embrace God and God is glorified in fixing people's problems, working miracles, increasing your finances, healing sick bodies, amen, restoring innocence into your consciousness, into your conscience, amen, setting people free from addictions, literally, in reality, Affecting the physical world and the spiritual world within us and the world surrounding us. God really cares about you and that he wants to help you. But he needs our cooperation. I want to look at that for a minute. Our co cooperation is agreeing with God. Amen. God, hey man, whatever you have for my life, I want it. There's nothing better then, amen, your plans for my life, I could try 101 different options, but doing it your way is so much more satisfying. Yes. Let's go. 
whatever you have for my life and whenever you want it to occur, let's do it. And that that is our cooperation, agreeing with God, following his plan. Secondly, where the, uh, it, it may be strange, it may be awkward, it may seem illogical, it might not make any sense in a practical way, but it is totally God. Amen. Even if it takes a long time, just continue in it. Keep believing. Keep calling on Him. Keep your faith intact. Amen. And thirdly, believing Him for nothing less than miracles. Surely He gives us our daily bread. Amen. He gives us, you know, practical things. He meets our needs. He feeds us. Everyone looks really well fed here. Amen. Everybody is not, you know, without a house or shelter. You know, you've got clothes. God's taking care of your practical needs. But there's something supernatural that he can loose into your life. Amen. Those practical things, keeping your family healthy, those are good. But I'm talking about something far more excellent. And that is surrendering our understanding beyond the natural, beyond the commonplace, and beyond our will, amen, and into what God wants and cooperating with him for a miracle. Can anybody say amen? amen. This is where it's at right here, man, cooperation. Secondly, we need to pray, amen. Above all that we ask or think, Paul is writing, we have to ask. And then we have to include to the part of thinking that is understanding God's ability. We have to secondly ask. And we have to have a prayer life. Now when we pray in our church service, it's not just part of a liturgy. David's going to pray again. All right, good luck. Say your prayer and blah, blah, blah. It's more than that. But we're calling on the advocacies of heaven, the power of God to move in our situation, your life and your city, your town here. Amen. It's not just a part of the lit liturgy. It has its place. We have needs for personal miracles and also corporate miracles. We need God to move. We are a desperate people. We are lost and we are without hope. We have no direction without calling on the God of heaven to intervene. Most definitely, we need to have a personal and a prayer life. If the only time you say amen is at church, you're missing out, okay? I'll go to church and let other people pray. Amen, that's good enough for me. You've got to pray on your own. You've got to begin your own prayer life privately. Find yourself time, one man said. I say, make yourself time. You have to look at your schedule and make it happen, man. Get a hold of God and separate your life, amen, so that you can uh, have God move in you, amen. You personally need to call on God, amen. Personally, thank you, that's it easy kind of a prayer. Thank you for my health. Thank you that I'm not in the hospital. Thank you that I have a job. Thank you that I can talk. Thank you that I can have a, a, a device. Thank you, Lord God. It's, that's just a very basic way of praying. Thank, thanking him. Amen. That's like a beginning. Uh, and personally make your petition, your petition known before God. Whether in your house or in your car or at the beach, or maybe you're in the park or wherever you are, on your job even, you can thank God, you can talk to God, you can let your petition be made known before God. You can ask. And then that's how things are going to begin to happen in your life. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with Thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. We need to ask God. Ask God and keep asking. Luke 11, 9. So I say to you, ask, Jesus says, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock 
and it will be open to you. How deep are you praying? How deep have you prayed in the prayer room? How deep have you prayed uh, at your house? How serious are you about asking God and calling on his power? Amen. How deep are your prayers? Are you praying for your marriage? Maybe you're not married. You can pray for your future spouse. Are you praying for success with your ministry? Uh, are you praying for your sick body? Or are you just giving up? Are you praying for your children, your sons and daughters? But how deep does your faith really penetrate? Simple addition would be a natural application, right? A, A plus B plus C or one plus one equals two. Uh, and exponential multiplication would be more like praying to God for some supernatural intervention. This doesn't make sense. Uh, some people apply for a job. I don't have the right um, background. I don't have the right skills. And that, yet God gives them that job. That's a supernatural effect of praying and praying to God. God can do things above and beyond exceedingly, abundantly, above what you ask. And there are things that God is really drawn towards. Amen. He's impressed, not with the eloquent prayers, but more like the depth of the prayer and the insanity of it, the audacious requests that you make before God gets his attention. He's like, wait a minute, did you guys hear that? Hey, Gabriel, Michael, check, check this one out over here. And all the angels are like, shh. <laughs> and they're listening for your prayer. And you're going on, you're like, I want to see this happen and that happen. I want to see a leg grow out. Or I want to see this person who's deaf, they need to be healed. And I believe in Jesus. And they're like, you got God's attention, man. You are serious. There will be an acceleration of progress and dominion in your life as you begin to pray and ask God. God loves audacious requests. He loves insane beliefs. He loves outlandish prayers. Think with me about the Roman centurion. Jesus is called to his house, and uh, so he starts on his journey there, and uh, the Roman centurion says, you know, look, my servant is sick, but you don't even need to come to my house. Say the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, that's amazing. I love that prayer. I don't even need to go there. And God heals his sick servant that very hour. Think about the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was possessed with a demon. And she said, even the dogs lick the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Amen. God, God is like blown away. He's like, yes, for this word that you have just said, I am going to heal your daughter. She was healed that very hour. One man wrote here, the holiest of Christians and those who understand the best of gospel of Christ find inside themselves a constant inclination to look to the power of the creature instead of looking to the power of God and the power of God alone. This is Charles Spurgeon, one of our great uh, commentators on Christianity. We have to look to God and God's power alone to solve your deepest problems, your most serious issues. Let's secondly look at the power in us. That we can pray and watch God move in us, inside of us, inside of our lives, immediately. God's power is released in us when we need it. When we access it by faith. It's available, it's waiting there. It's like, it's on a shelf. And when you call out to God for it, God takes it off the shelf and hands it over to you. It's like, there you go. In a personal application, we have a couple of conversions I want to look at. The first one is Jeff Beswick. He was a mindless schizophrenic drug addict who used to huff cans of spray paint 
lived in Mount Hope Cemetery for years. His parents were advised by the doctors to plan his funeral. Jeff comes to church. He believes God. He gets saved. Amen. This man now gets a job and he gets married. He's got ministry. God heals his, his mind. He's got a new life. That is a miracle. He becomes a pastor. That's above and beyond what he could do on his own. Maybe through therapy or medica medication, excuse me. But he was able to access the power of God. Amen. This is what glorifies God. Secondly, we have Roman Gutierrez. Amen. A child that was born out of wedlock to a single mom who raised him by herself at age eight. She said to him, I shouldn't have even had you. What kind of curse is that on a young boy? He grows up. There's no father figure around. He heads for the streets. He joins a gang. He's using drugs. He's drinking alcohol. And he's brought to the hospital two times, twice dead. Because of his addictions to drugs, he's flatlined. They bring him in the ambulance. Amen. The same good results in his life. He lets God have power in his life. His mother is praying for him. She got saved in the middle of all that. She brings him to church. He comes to church. Everyone is afraid of him. You can imagine. He's just like a mean looking dude. And he gets saved. And God releases his power inside of Roman Gutierrez, just like Jeff Beswick. Amen. He turns his life around. This is a Tucson, Arizona, I believe. His mother's prayers are answered. Amen. Are you praying for your kids? Are you praying for your parents? Are you praying for other people in your community? And are you praying for, for the worst of the worst? You think of somebody in your mind right now and you're like, oh, they're too far gone. Forget it. They'll never get saved. Impossible. Those are the people that God is looking for. And those many times are the people that do get saved. And when they get saved, amen, they are outrageously on fire. He that is loved much, or he that is forgiven much is loved much. And they do great things exploits for God. Beyond psychoanalyst, psychotherapy, beyond medication, Roman Gutierrez gets saved, he uh, gets married, he gets, starts to get involved in the church. Today he's one of our finest preachers, Roman Gutierrez. Why? Because he was able to access God's power. And miracles are available to us just like they were in the Old Testament. We see what God did for Moses when he's backed up, he's got a million people, he's leading out of Egypt and they're at the Red Sea, there's no way to go. God says, stretch forth your staff and the Red Sea parts. And then miracles are available to you and I. Ephesians 3, 20, now him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, amen. How about the widow's oil? I preached on that uh, two weeks ago, the overflowing. She's filling all these empty pots with oil and it just keeps coming out and she makes all this wealth and she sells it and she's able to save her sons from becoming slaves. Amen. We have the four lepers in uh, Hezekiah's day where uh, the, the land... The city was stopped up by the army, amen. And they said, well, what can we do? You know, we could either die here, we have leprosy, just hanging out, or we can go into the army and turn ourselves in. Maybe they'll have mercy on us and give us some food. And as they're walking, God supernaturally makes the steps sound like an army of 10,000. And the Assyrians are like, dude, they hired somebody to fight us. Let's get out of here. And they run and the camp is empty when they get there. They're like, they start stopping their face, they're looking around, waiting for the, the ambush, and they're drinking the wine, they're eating the food, they're stealing the wedges of silver, putting them in their pockets, and like, dude, we need to tell somebody about this. This is pretty cool. God gave them a miracle. 
Amen. Miracles in the Old Testament. Jesus opened the blind eyes, the deaf ears, those who couldn't speak, those sons of uh, who were throwing themselves in the fire and in the water, amen. Jesus cast out those demon spirits in a moment's time and they were healed. God gives miracles above and beyond. Think of that father, how relieved he was when God gave him that miracle for his son. How about raising Lazarus from the dead? Roll away the, the stone, but Lord, he stinks by this time, right? So they're not really believing that Jesus, I, we trust you. We know you're the resurrection and the life, but you sure you got this one? Roll the stone. They move the stone. And he calls out Lazarus. 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 He lifts up his voice and Lazarus shows up doing the Hebrew hop. Hallelujah. He's alive from the dead. How many believe that? Yeah. Jesus quotes the widow of Zarephath. Amen. Who wasn't even a, a Jewish person. Amen. Where her uh, sons were raised to life. And Naaman the Syrian wasn't even a Jew. And uh, Jesus brings it to their attention that God moved for these non-Jewish people. Amen. Gave them a miracle. Naaman is healed of his leprosy like a baby. His skin is turned after he dips into Jordan seven times. J.I. Packer writes, Our high... And privileged calling is to do the will of God in the power of God for the glory of God. Let's close this evening and talk for a minute here about God's glorification. God is glorified when our, our hearts are open to him, when his power is released within us. To him be glory in the church. By Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever in the church. Amen. God is glorified in our church and in our church services, in the gathering. With the called out ones, with the sanctified and separate from the world ones, the forgiven ones here in the church, the church of the living God. God is glorified when we gather together. The church that Jesus is building. This is the local church. Yes, the universal church. God is glorified in all of those all over the world. In Asia, in Latin America. Yes, that's true. But here in Greece, New York, God is glorified in your life when you access that power. And that power is released in you for your very own miracle. Amen. Old people, young people. Amen. Teenagers, Russians, uh, Latinos, uh, Koreans, Asians, Europeans, Russians, all kinds of people. Amen. God is glorified in the church. Amen. We worship and praise. Psalms 22, 3. Yet the psalmist writes, you are holy and you are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. You know, God inhabits the praises of Israel. In other words, when we are worshiping God, God shows up, and God shows up in his song service when people's hearts are into it. We sing songs, we applaud him, that's why we clap, we give him glory. He is magnified in our service, worship. He is adored, he is appreciated when we sing the songs, when we uh, engage in worship. We're activated. We're participating in that worship. We're reverencing him. Psalm 63, verse 4. Thus I will bless you, writes the psalmist, while I live. You know, when you get in that grave, amen, you know, there's going to be no more time as a, a, a human to worship God except in heaven in your glorified body. But now we have a chance in church, we can worship him. Amen. I will lift up my hands in your name. Some of you are wondering why we lift our hands in church. Man, it's a sign of surrender. Yeah. Why do we clap in church? There's many churches that don't clap. They think it's not of God. But I have a scripture here to remind you. 
how it shows approval. It's an agreement and appreciation for a person or an effect, an effort, excuse me. Applause is the way of an encouragement from a spectator or a recipient of the favor. Psalms 47 may be the only place that authorizes the clapping of hands in a worship service. But that is sufficient. That's enough for me. They do it at football games. They do it for uh, full contact. They applaud. They scream. They shout. They're like, you know, any kind of event you see out there, concerts. They're applauding. They're hooting. They're hollering. They're, they're, uh, in a way, they're worshiping that sport. They are worshiping that event. And in Psalm 47, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. I mean, the church is not just for the effeminate and for, you know, people that are just, you know, halfway nominal. They're just, you know, they're just going along for the ride. But it's for those who have had a miracle. The power of God has been released in them. And we release that worship here back to God. Amen. He's a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us. The excellence of Jacob, whom he loves. You know, God really loves his church. He loves you. You may not realize it, but we in turn should love him back. And that is worshiping him and reverencing him. That God is glorified in the preaching. Peter 4, verse 11. Whoever speaks is to do it as one who is speaking utterances or oracles of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Speech glorifies God. When you talk, amen, your words should glorify God. They should uplift and they should honor him. Amen. Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel flying in the mid heaven, having an eternal gospel, to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said, with a loud voice, fear God and give him the glory. Amen. The altar call is another place that we reverence God, that we glorify him. Amen. There is a response to the preaching. Luke 15, 7. I tell you that that very same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Over the 99 just or righteous persons who do not need to repent. God is excited when people repent. If all of heaven erupts, amen, when somebody gets saved, you and I should do the same thing and uh, utilize the altar call to glorify God. God is glorified when people answer the altar call. It shows that they agree with the sermon. Perhaps there is a certain aspect a particular angle, something that God revealed to them or taught them or sh like, it's kind of like a little glimmer that you see off of a diamond and then a little shine, something was added to your life. And so we have the altar that you can come forward to and glorify God, either visiting the altar by kneeling, sitting, standing, praying. It's an opportunity to seal in your heart what God has spoken to you personally. That's why we do altar calls. And God is glorified, especially when someone answers an altar call for salvation, like our sister Jean did this morning. Praise God. Let's close with eternal worship, amen, to all generations. When God's power is working in us, amen, it spills out into other people. Amen. It creates a testimony in our lives that we have experienced God personally, in reality, having been healed or touched or saved or delivered. Amen. Revelation 7, verse 9. 
Our worship here on earth is in preparation for worship in heaven. Revelation 7 9 describes what worship in heaven will look like. Every nation, every tribe, and every tongue, amen, worshiping God before his throne, crying out, salvation belongs to our Christ. Amen. The power that's in us. Smith Wigglesworth is quoted as saying, the power of God will take you out of your own plans and put you in the plan of God. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Amen. Let God's power work in you. If you're not saved, I'd like to give you an opportunity to give your life to Christ. Amen. Jesus is here this evening for those to get saved. Amen. If you're not saved, I want you to understand that Christ died on the cross for your sins. He died as a sin payment by his blood that your sins could be removed from you and you could experience the power of God to extract that from your life and to release you into a new way of thinking, a new life, a life of dominion, a life of power, a life of living, uh, rejecting sin, repenting, turning away from sin and running to God. That's the picture that we're talking about this evening. God really loves you, wants to save you. And you're ready to give your life to Christ. You're ready to bow your knee. That's you this evening, amen. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or maybe you're online, or maybe you're backslidden, you have wandered away from God's provision, God's blessing. Your life certainly is not glorifying Him in the actions of your life, in the practices, or in your thinking. And, uh, and that God wants all the glory for Himself. He's a jealous God. He wants you all to Himself. If you're willing to do that, to come back to Him, God will forgive you. How many would there be in this place? You're not saved or you're backslidden with an uplifted hand from the left to the right, front to back, amen, all across this building. Whether you're online maybe and you feel <coughs> a sense, God, you, uh, you're you thinking, man, I need to give my life back to Jesus. That's you. Amen. You want to pray, amen. Give your life to Christ. Okay, amen. Let's just go ahead and pray. If you believe that, that this is for you, for now, amen, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for the way I've been living. Thank you for the cross. Make me brand new. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse my conscience and help me to do right. Help me to believe. I repent of my sin turn myself over to you this night and forever more I will serve you in Jesus name praise God if that's you I'd like you to contact us shoot us a text or an email and let us know how we can serve you and help you to serve God and experience his power on a daily basis Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to sing this song, How Great Is Our God. The splendor of the King.
said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. 